I'm going to start off by saying, gentlemen, welcome to the Tales of Leadership podcast. How are you both doing? Super doing great today. Thanks yep. for asking. Yep. Same here. Thanks, Joshua. Yeah. So I always like to take the time at the very beginning of allowing our guests to kind of introduce themselves. And Keith, if we could start with you, if you could take the time just to quickly provide an overview. Yeah, happy to do it. And again, thanks for spending some time with us and allowing us to spend some time with you as we learn and talk about leadership. Uh, Keith Thurgood, I live in Dallas, Texas, retired two-star general, spent some time in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I've also had the opportunity to lead some pretty large organizations. So if you're in the military, you may know AFES are now the exchange. I was the CG and CEO of that organization for a period of time. Um, I've been the, one of the senior leaders at Walmart and Sam's Club, leading one of their $15 billion business units. And today I'm a professor at the University of Texas at Dallas, where I lead a graduate program in healthcare management and leadership, where we teach our clinicians and non-clinicians about uh, transformation, transformational leadership, driving change, striving for excellence. And then finally, I've got five kids and 15 grandkids. Wow. Congratulations on all of that, sir. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Neil, if you could take the time to introduce yourself to the listeners. Yeah, thanks, Joshua. And again, thanks for having us on. It's uh, it's not very often I get to do a podcast <laughs> with my brother. So that's all, that, all a good thing. That is true. It uh, Yeah, I just retired from the military, active duty for just under 38 years, uh, about a year ago. Uh, so, you know, I enlisted as a young soldier in the infantry a long time ago and, and uh, came up through the ranks and and did uh, was blessed to do some pretty great things. Um, I've commanded at every level from from captain to, to three star, retired as a three star. Uh, in my last job, I was actually uh, stood up a, a brand new organization to teach to try to do the material buying of our our army differently than it's ever been done, say, in the last 40 years. So building teams, organizational culture, leading teams, how to lead teams. Uh, was was what I spent my time doing. Uh, since I retired, I I, I work uh, uh, full time with a company called Andrel, which is a, a startup company, uh, very dynamic, very passionate, focused on the defense, uh, which matches you know my passion for helping soldiers, service members, and then uh, and I also work with the University of Alabama uh, here in Huntsville um, on their leadership programs. Uh, with President Carr, the president of the university. So just been a great opportunity uh, now to to serve so far long in the military and then on now on the, on the industrial defense industrial base side uh, and on the education side, which is a passion of, of mine for teaching. That's I think it's very interesting that I have two brothers uh, that were in the military together on the podcast at the same time, but both of you, have achieved exceptionally high ranks in the army and that, that's no like small thing so i'm curious having you both on here at the same time was there any level of competition between you as you're going through the ranks well i i would i would say this and neil neil jump in for a period of time we were both in the pentagon and i was up on the third floor something like that and he was one below literally one below and Every once in a while, I'd go down to see what he was doing. At the time, he was a colonel. He was the chief of staff for uh, the, part of the acquisition corps. And uh, I would go down. I, at the time, I was, you know, I was already been promoted, so I was a general. And I would go, the first time I went down there, the people in the office looked at me and said, hey, weren't you a colonel when you left the office? <laughs> and, 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 now you're, and now you're a general <laughs> coming back. I said, yeah, that's tough. Quickly, things happen in the Army. But I would say... I don't know if there was really any competition to say. What I would say is that we've been in our family, we've tried to do things that I think that most great leaders do. And mm -hmm. that is focus on purpose. Try to be somebody that's going to add value at the end of the day. And then when you do those kinds of things and you're focused on those kinds of things, the cards fall where they fall at the end of the day. Yeah. So for me, it wasn't really always about becoming a general or a CEO. That just happened to be the fruit of, I think, being self-aware, being humble, gracious, recognizing that you're not the smartest person in the room and that 
you can make a difference in certain areas uh, in any organization. So I don't know, Neil, comment? Yeah, I think uh, when we were much younger, of course, like any brothers, we wrestled and and, uh, and occasionally we still do wrestle when we get together. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, it was never a competition on on a measure of success professionally. And and I, I would say the strength of that came from our our parents, right? Mm. Who really raised us well. And then in our in my case, I'm sure in Keith's case, where we had great leaders that mentored us and taught us and took us under their wings and developed us, saw potential maybe we didn't see in ourselves. And when you have a brother, uh, and we have a sister as well who who's just like, you know, just is successful in her her professional domain. Um it it really is a springboard, not a competition. Yeah. It's, it's how do you, how do you learn from each other? You know, when Keith was working on his doctorate, I was working on my doctorate. What did we learn together? What could we do together? So I don't, it was never a competition. It was, it was more of a springboard of a, a, a lifetime of relationship. And, and that helped accelerate, I think, um, our learning capabilities and, and what we believe and became passionate about and the characteristics and the fundamentals of leadership. I, I really love that between a, like a springboard type of having an accountability partner, almost in the way of being able to push through some of the more challenging experiences that you probably face, because both of you gentlemen have achieved a lot and include educationally. You're both achieved doctorate degrees, and that's no small thing in itself. What I would love to kind of start off with at the beginning phases of your military journey, what drove you both to join the military? Well, I'll start. And by the way, I may add this too. Everything that Neil knows about generalship, I had to teach him while he was a colonel. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> I would say I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a little bit of a snapshot. I don't know if this will be helpful or not to the listeners, but when I got out of high school, my parents were in Germany. Our dad is a retired colonel, uh, infantry ranger, aviator. And uh, at the time, he was stationed at Stuttgart, Germany, where I graduated from high school and where Neil went to high school as well. And I came back to go to school, and I talked to a recruiter one day. He said, hey, you ought to join the Army. And I'm like, well, I know a little bit about the Army. So I signed up, and I was a private. I went to basic training and AIT. And uh, at the time, they have a, pro a program called Simultaneous Membership Program. So I, yep. I, I eventually uh, got through basic training and AIT, and then went back to my reserve unit at the time, and eventually got, uh, I was, a, then I signed up for ROTC, and they allowed me to be in this S&P program. And what I learned from that experience was, one, as I went to basic training, it started to instill in me this idea that people can make a difference. And it really doesn't matter what level you are, because organizations need leaders at every single level of every single organization. And this implies that we as, as just good citizens of the nation and as good, um, as good leaders in the military, we need to model the right kinds of behaviors. And so I started to see that right in basic training, the impact that leaders have. In fact, if I were to see my drill sergeant, I'm pretty sure I would be locked up at attention standing in the hallways because of the way they, the things that you learn. So I learned from that experience that, you know, leaders make a difference all the time. And those early experiences in real life leadership positions helped frame up my thinking so mm. that when I was commissioned, I was, you know, a regular lieutenant. And when I was a lieutenant, one of my first assignments was to Europe. And I was a platoon leader and we had, uh, I was in the transportation corps at the time. So it was all about logistics. And we, one of our missions was port clearance. So we would, you know, all these ships would come in, we would unload them, we'd put them on trucks and send them all over Europe and the Benelux countries. But I had an additional duty, much like you're familiar with. And one of my additional duties was to take a, an American team to what was then called the Nijmegen marches. So these were marches that were international in scope. The U.S. sent a couple of teams. I took one. And it was a march that was 100 miles, four days, 25 miles a day mm, wow. to, to celebrate the 
World War II. And if you've seen the movie A Bridge Too Far, it's yeah. about Nijmegen and Remagen. It's those bridges in Holland. So I took this team. We walked about a thousand miles over the course of four or five months. That's all I did every day, 20 to 25 miles a day. And one day the formation was just getting out of control. And so I stopped the formation, gave them a half right face, front leaning rest position, knock out a couple of push ups, back to attention, forward march. And about 10 minutes later, the same thing happened again. And I stopped the formation and I looked up the for formation and I could see who was causing the problem. It was this young private up in the very front. So I ran up to the front of the formation. Now, I, if you can imagine this, how dumb this is. I mean, you'd never want to do this today. I reached in and I grabbed this shoulder, this young soldier by his collar and I yanked him out of the formation. And he knew that I was totally irritated. And as I yanked him out of the formation, he tripped and he fell on the ground. So I'm staring at him. He's staring at me. The entire formation is like, what the heck just happened here? And in that moment, I recognized that I wasn't the leader that I knew that I should be and mm. that I could be. And that was one of the early moments in my life where I'm like, okay, yeah, I got all those awards in, in college and I got a bunch of awards on active duty. But you know what? At the end of the day, that was a turning point for me to recognize that, you know what? You have a lot to learn here, Lieutenant. You have a lot to learn. So, no. Neil, over to you. Yeah. <laughs> So you had, the question you asked, Josh, which is a good one, which is, you know, what made you want to come in the Army? Um, and, and I can think of, of two very specific things that, that shaped my thought of, of what I thought would be important values that drove me uh, for the passion for success. So the first was in Germany, uh, our father, who was then on the uh, staff uh, as a major uh, and lieutenant colonel, he took us to Berlin and I remember very distinctly, I was 13, 12 or 13 years old. And I remember very distinctly, like it was yesterday, I can almost smell it, that standing on checkpoint, Charlie, looking across the Berlin wall. And I, I remember thinking very clearly in my mind, those people are not happy. This can be better. There is something to this thing that we call freedom. <laughs> and what I'm looking at is not that. Mm. And, and that has stuck with me for a long time. And then fast forward a few years, uh, you might recall on, on military theaters, they would play the national anthem before each movie. Yeah. And, and I remember going to the theater with my father and he would, we'd all of course stand up and he would play the national anthem, two tours in Vietnam. Matter of fact, those two Chinooks on the wall behind me, uh, if you can see those, one was given to me in 1967, my dad's first tour in Vietnam and one was 1969, his second tour in Vietnam. Oh, wow. Um, I can remember watching my dad listen to the national anthem and crying. And I'm like, you know, I was a young kid. I'm like, hey, big cry, baby. <laughs> but now having served for 38 years on active duty, I am that guy. What I learned in that moment of time watching my dad was something I didn't understand at the time, but came to appreciate, which is this great country we live in, this great republic, this great experiment called America needs people who are going to put the greater good above themselves. And that gets right to the leadership principles that, that I think have formed, you know, Keith and I over the years uh, and the passion to, to do things. And, and then I'll, I'll just share you. I, I can remember the moment in time I decided I wanted to be a, a leader. I was enlisted. I was the RTO for a Lieutenant named Jane Conway. He was an infantry ranger, airborne hula hula killer guy. And we were on a patrol. We've been awake for a few days and we were under our ponchos in those days, under our poncho with a red light, <laughs> yep. looking at the map. And I was the RTO. So I had the, the PRC 77 on my back and I'm down there on the map under the poncho with Jay Conway, Lieutenant Jay Conway. He's my platoon leader. And I'd been out there a few times and it was his first time out there. And he was lost bigger than Stuttgart. He was lost like, <laughs> you know, Monday morning Easter egg. <laughs> and I, and I, he said, Hey, where do you think we are? I said, I'm, we're right here. So we are right here. He goes, no, no, I think we're over here. And I remember sitting there in the rain under the poncho with my red light going, I can do this better. I can do this better. 
and I'll do whatever it takes to never be the weak link in the formation. And, and I think that's what leaders do. They realize that, that leaders must always have the capacity, no matter what's happening around them, to help others. And, and those leaders that use all of their capacity or haven't developed enough excess capacity in, in themselves will struggle to become great leaders because they'll spend so much time looking inward. They won't spend the time looking outward to help those around them. Mm. Mm. That, that, I, I love that. that. I love that, Neil, because it reminds me of, you know, how the army defines leadership. And I think it's a really great definition, even though there's no universal definition on what effective leadership is. But the way the army thinks about it is it's the ability to influence others to accomplish the mission by inspiring them, providing motivation and purpose that we should probably come back to. But there's a second component to that, and it's about creating an organization that's better than when you left it. So great yeah. leaders, at least the ones that I know of, do those two things. They always accomplish the mission. You can never take your eye off the ball of the revenue stream or driving productivity, but simultaneously, they also set the organization up for success. They're always developing leaders. They're building the capacity and the capability that they need so the organization can extend well beyond their own life cycle. Yeah, it's, it is. If the if the organization only works when you're leading it, you have not developed the organization for success. The organization and the value stream you put in place, if, if it is of value, will work when you're not there. And it will work after you leave the organization. And and you have to have the capacity to think through that. So so to tie those two thoughts together, right? If you're if you're so busy trying to keep keep yourself in the formation when you're running, then you have no ability to help those around you in the formation. <laughs> yeah. You have no ability to shape what's happening around you. If your entire capacity is used up, just trying to do your piece and your piece only. That was one thing that I had to learn quickly. Yeah. I, I'm still active duty. Um, and then Neil kind of to the point I'm, I've served in acquisition corps. Now I started off as an infantryman. Uh, so a lot of those stories resonate, Keith, with you as a uh, simultaneous membership program. I started that through Marshall University. I was in the National Guard and then kind of commissioned through that process. And then looking at a map with a red light under a poncho, I spent countless nights doing that, especially at Fort Polk, Louisiana, which I hope to, <laughs> to never go back to that place again. <laughs> but that was one of the things that I had to, that I'm learning now is that I have to be able to look beyond my current scope. I guess what I like to call like leadership intelligence, it's not about me anymore. And that was really at the company command slot of where I have to be able to look through me uh, and then develop systems and processes that make the organization better, but also whenever I leave, which will happen one day, that organization can still move forward. And what I would love to hear from from both of you, and then Keith, you you hit the nail on the head, and I was going to bring that up of how you both define leadership, purpose, direction, and, and motivation. Uh, and it's universal in the Ranger Handbook or in ADP 6-22, because I kind of nerded out on that. And I love how you go back to that definition of influence, because I think that that's one of the core pieces of it. But as you gentlemen kind of grew through your army experience, being lieutenants um, and then moving to be a company grade officer and then a field grade officer and eventually a flag officer, how did your leadership maturity grow through those ranks? It, yeah. So I, you brought up some really good points here. And one, I would classify it as a journey. So mm. some people think when you think about leadership development, there's a, a seminar that I can go to. There's a great podcast that I can listen to. There's, <laughs> there's, a, there's a great book I can go get. There's a Gantt chart. chart. I, I can go get my you know, 12 things that I need to go do, and those make me a great leader. It's called leadership development for a reason. And this is why I think that the military has absolutely got this right. Yeah. I don't know of another organization, and I've been I've been senior leader, CEO, president of big organizations. Pepsi's a you know fifty billion dollar organization. Walmart is a five hundred billion dollar organization, and I'm just telling you, there's two things you have to get right in every organization. One is leaders 
matter. And you got to get the right people to paraphrase Col uh, Collins. You got to get them on right. the bus. And once they're on the bus, you got to give them the right seat. And then the corollary to that is once you have the right leaders, then you can develop the right strategies, right? Which should be theoretically and practically tied to the end state, to the vision. So that when people are executing, they know exactly what's happening and how um, how their particular job impacts the strategy and the outcomes overall. And to your question specifically, what I've learned is in terms of influence is this simple idea. The key to human influence is to first be influenced. The key to being mm. powerful is to give your power away. And that has all kinds of implications, empowerment, responsibility, accountability, et cetera. But you cannot, as a leader, think that you're the smartest person in the room. You actually might be the smartest person in the room. And this would apply probably to Neil more than me because he works with rocket scientists. But you, 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 you have to be humble. You have to be grateful. You have to be influenceable. And the magic of that little formula is when you are influenceable, you build trust, which is the glue that holds teams together. Mm. And you become known as a very trustworthy person, a person of integrity. You get those two things right. You can build an organization. You can build an effective team. So my early lesson for me was I'm not as smart as I think I am. I'm not as good as I think I am. Nobody in this room's got a corner on good ideas. Therefore, let me learn. Let me grow. Let me create some psychological safety in the organization. Let me give chance. Let me give team members a chance to fail a little bit here. So we, we recognize that failure is not a tragedy. It's a tutor. It's a way to help everybody grow and build the capacity that you need in the organization. So, Neil, over to you. Yeah, I think the, the model you started with, Joshua, I think the military's got a good piece of this right. Um, but but the, the academic and learning of that military process, the decision making process, which which is a consistent characteristic of leaders. Right. I, I'm also the same school. I don't believe that you can read all these books sitting here behind me or yeah. behind Keith. These 16 things do these six things. You'll be a great leader. I, I, I don't believe that. Um, what I believe is that great leaders have a toolbox. And they pull from that toolbox the things they need to at the time it needs to be pulled to empower the team around them for mission success. Leadership is, is of all the definitions, the one I particularly uh, am fond of is le leaderships allow teams to accomplish what they would not accomplish on their own. Mm. And that's a very powerful tool and it encompasses many of the thoughts that we're talking about. You, you talked about being a young company commander, the maturation of leadership is also about the maturation of self. Great leaders know themselves. They know how they behave. They know how they assimilate and make decisions, how they assimilate information. They know how they, what, what, what excites them and what upsets them. Um, and you think about how you have been taught to make leaders and you see this in, in, I've seen this in corporations. I've seen it in the military, young, young officers. I'll just use a military example. Young officers come in, and from the time you're a lieutenant to a captain to a major, you're paid and you are excellent at accomplishing a task with a team. Yeah. It's task orientation and it's task oriented thinking. And, and then you go off to CGSC or the advanced course and you learn to think differently. And by the time you get to be a battalion commander and a brigade commander, it's all about strategic thinking, right? Because you're not, you're not the one probably turning the wrenches or climbing the hill or fixing the tank or fixing a helicopter. You have, you're developing teams of people to do that. And so this capacity to understand and link from why PFC Thurgood is going to turn a wrench today and why that goes all the way up to the national defense strategy. You have to be able to see mm -hmm. that vision and explain that vision from top to bottom. Task it, you know, ends, may, ends ways and means is, is a term we use in the military. It's the same as task, purpose, end state, vision, mission, all of those things are designed to create the vision of those around you. When I was in my last tour in Afghanistan in 17 and 18, General Nicholson was the, the commander uh, and I was the DCG. He started every staff call I went to in a year with these words. He would say, team, and this is all the division commanders, right? All, all the two stars, all the, our, the commanders from, from the region. 
He said, team, let's begin with a common understanding and a shared visualization. Mm. Why are we here and what are we trying to accomplish? Let's make sure that we can all see the same sight picture of the thing that we're here to do. Because as Keith said, if, if they're only going to do it the way you want to have it done, it probably isn't the best way, <laughs> right? You've got to, you've got to energize the team around you. And, and my experience has been, if you can do that, they'll come up with a really great solution. Uh, and, and they'll come up with creative, innovative solutions that will actually probably accelerate the success of the mission and those around them. I, I love the concept of like a psychological safe environment. And I think the military at least does a, a fairly good job of that, especially within the the acquisitions core with a lot of like the rapid prototyping elements that we kind of go through and thinking through like the engineering model, failing fast and failing small. So being able to find a, a problem and then quickly integrate and improve upon that every single time. But also the strategic level thinking of what both of you gentlemen said, and I love podcasting from this point of view, is that no other time would I ever have a one-on-one -on -one conversation for an hour with two highly successful generals that are also happen to be brothers. Uh, so that is awesome. And I can see themes and correlations. So when I had General Petraeus on here, who were talking about strategic level thinking and how he thinks through that, get the big ideas right, the concepts be able to clearly communicate those to the organization, set metrics out of how we want to get to those and how we can define it and then iterate. How are we continuing to get through that process? And, and I love being able to see those correlations between all the different, no, regardless of what your background is, a logistician, uh, infantryman, or being able to be an acquisition officer, starting off as an infantryman, those common principles and leadership core competencies and characteristics are universal. And one of the key things that I wanted to go back to uh, that you both kind of hit on is understanding the leadership methodology, the educational piece of it, and then having leadership experience. And I think in the military, we do a fairly good job of uh, educating our workforce, but the experience is where we really shine. If you give me an infantry lieutenant, and I give him a task and purpose. He's going to go do it. It doesn't matter what it is. But the education behind that, I think, is often lacking in terms of like tools in the toolkit. How does the civilian sector do that in terms of developing leaders would be something I'm very interested in. Well, I'll give you so, my perspective. Oh, go ahead, Neil. You go. Go. I, I, I was just going to um, offer a couple of thoughts there. Um, having, yeah. you know, I've been been. Uh, teaching for quite a, a number of years uh, in the academic world and in the industry world. H here's here's where there's a, a gap uh, that that the military has through a very deliberate education process. So so you went to, uh, you know, officer basic course, advanced course, CGSC, war college, and you named the school. We've we've been through that. And that's a very it's a very deliberate way to refresh your professional knowledge over time. Go to your average industry partner and go, when's the last time you went to professional education? When was the last time you went to a, a particular thing? Unless you're a senior executive, if you're in the middle of that organization, you probably, it was probably your master's degree. <laughs> yeah. if, if you have one, maybe your undergraduate degree. Um, I had the chance to go to, to a school up in Boston and uh, I was a major at the time. And, uh, and I had just left the, the, the war fighting army and came out of uh, Task Force 160 Special Operations Aviation. I'm, a, I'm a, an aviator by basic branch as an officer. And, uh, and I was with this, this group of people at, at, at school up in Boston. And they were, it was the economic minister from Japan, you know, lumber company presence, oil company presence, anybody that we would define as success in this, in this 10 week course I went to, uh, part of my doctorate program. And, about three weeks into it, after the teacher left, the entire class said, hey, hey, Neil, we want you to stay behind. We want to talk to you. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be bad. You know, I'm a major. <laughs> I'm a major in the Army. <laughs> yeah. You know, these guys are just by every measure of success. And what they said to me, uh, I've uh, lives with me this day. They said, Neil, we want we want you to teach us how to make decisions. Hmm. And like, what? He goes, yeah, we don't we don't have a decision-making process that we can use repeatedly 
over and over that's consistent and gets us to a good answer every time. And Joshua, I promise you, you could do that in your sleep. We could give you 70% of the information. Nine times out of 10, you'll make the right choice. And you'll do it so fast you won't even recognize because you've practiced the process of leadership and decision making inherent to inherent to the outcome. And, and what happens is, is, and I'll just give you a simple example. How many times have you given a task to a subordinate and and you trans and you had the task clearly in your mind and it came out of your mouth and they went away and did the task and they came back and presented you a course of action or, or a resolution to the task. And you said in your mind, not out loud, but you said in your mind, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what and what you should have said, and what I what I've learned to say over time is that how is it possible that it was so clear in my mind that I articulated it so poorly that the person came back with what they believe is a great job and it was so far off the mark? That's on me. It's not on them. That's that's how leaders think, right? It, it's it's how is it? Because because no, I promise you, Joshua, no one woke up this morning in any job I've ever been part of, military, civilian, that said, you know, I'm going to work today and screw something up. That's just what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> no, no one does that. So so you must assume they're trying to do the right thing. So how is it when they come back with something that's so far off the mark? It must be that my guidance was so poor mm. that. I didn't use it correctly. I did not translate what was so clear in my mind, common understanding and shared visualization, so clear in my mind to them that they came back with that task. And a leader will will be introspective when the answers coming back are not what's expected. Rather than assume the person across the table is, is not trying to be successful, the assumption is how is it that I did not help them be successful? Mm, that's powerful. Yeah. And I, I would add on this, I'll, I'll give you a couple of data points to think about. One is, we talked earlier about the importance of purpose and the power of purpose in organizations. So yeah. once you're clear on that, which you have to spend a lot of time doing, and oh, by the way, this applies not only at the tactical, the operational, and the strategic, or in corporate lingo, the enterprise level, this applies at the individual level as well. So if yeah. you're not clear on what your purpose is, where your voice is, it's impossible for you to help others find their voice and therefore make a difference. But in organizations specifically, purpose-driven organizations grow 10% faster. They have uh, more successful product launches 56% of the time, and they grow globally faster as well. So there's a reason to talk about all this kind of stuff and, 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 and really drive it deep down to the organization. And I think we're, we're many organizations that I work with on the corporate side. So we said that the military does a great job. There's no question about that. You wanna be a, a, a battalion commander, guess what? You're gonna be 20 years in the army before yeah. you get to be a commander at that level. And think about this. When, when we fire a four-star general or one resigns or retires, we don't go to the Australians or to the Brits and say, hey, can I give you, can you give me one of your four-star generals to be the next chief of staff of the army? In the corporate world, we fire a CEO, we go find another one. We don't do that in the army. We grow and develop mm -hmm. our leaders over a long period of time in a sustained, methodical way. And this is so important because think of these other data points. If you think, the, and these are from a variety of different studies, and we can cite them later if we need to. 89% of leaders that come into organizations, new hires, admit that they don't have the complete skill sets they need to be successful. Now, think about that. 89%? Are you kidding me? That implies that we're not investing, we're not building the capability that we need. A couple of other data points for you. Great leaders create three times more economic value than poor leaders. High-performing teams that are held together by trust, that understand the enterprise point of view, deliver 48% improved productivity versus average performers. A couple of other data points for you. I don't, don't want to worry you out here. 
The t-shirt. Well, I've already taken six pages of. Uh, I'm not joking. Six pages of those. I love. Them. <laughs> Think of this. Fifty-eight percent of new senior executive hires, fifty-eight percent fail within eighteen months of being hired. Well, now, if that doesn't get you, think about this. Organizations that have great leadership, there's a 16% equity premium on the value of the company. And likewise, there's a 19% equity discount on the value of the company because of perceived poor leaders. And then one last data point. So given all of that, here's a stunning one. Only 30% of CEOs are confident they have the talent they need to grow their organizations into the future. So you think wow. about living in a world that is complex, it's ambiguous. You think about living in a world where there's black swans, gray rhinos. You have to have leaders that can think on their own. Distributed yeah. leadership matters more today than it ever has. And it's you have to get this right. And I think failure to get this right is a failure of epic proportions. And I don't believe that most organizations spend a, enough time investing in their people. And you see this every day. Why? Because if there's an expense, uh, a, a crunch on the expenses, what's one of the first things that goes? Training, travel, because it's an easy yeah. budget line. But it's the paradox of success. The very thing that you should not be doing most organizations end up doing it because it's easy. Um, so, so uh, that, go ahead, Bill. Yeah. So, so think about this this idea of 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 leaders of organizations that invest in in not only the the people around them and and continue its education, professional education, right? All these books that we have behind us, we don't read them to memorize them. We read them for ideas, yeah. right? There's books on mountain climbing. There's books on farming. There's books on building trains. <laughs> there's books. These books are about ideas to create thought, right? To create ideas around you and use the ideas and the power of connective tissue. Great leaders will make connections that, that your average leaders won't make. And they do that because they have a, a set of wide thinking strategic outcomes. So, so think about how we develop people to do that. And what are the tools we use to develop people to do that? In, in the, and I'll compare and contrast what Keith was saying with in the civilian world versus the military world. So you're a battalion commander. Did you get to choose the people in your organization? Probably not. <laughs> Where in a civilian, you may have inherited, but you can change that relatively quickly to Keith's point, right? A lot of people getting fired, a lot of people moving around the industrial base. Forced leadership to develop a successful organization in the military is a little bit different than leadership in a civilian. And, and I say different, not in the values that we're talking about, but different in the, the tools you use and the, and the, and the lobs and dials you can use to change those particular outcomes. You look at your average PhD, uh, um, you know, you said you're in the acquisition corps yes. in, in the army. And so you know, I interviewed every every officer and every a senior civilian that came in my organization when I was doing rapid capability, you know, uh, offensive hypersonic weapons and high energy lasers, high, high end technologies that that we need to accelerate to past the traditional model of BEO structures. Um, so, ask your next time you're in your office, ask your go up to your average PhD and go, hey there, Mister or Mrs. PhD. How many classes on leadership have you had to get mm. your doctorate? How many classes on decision-making have you had to get your doctorate? Oh, oh, by the way, the system engineering process is not a decision-making tool. <laughs> the engineering V is not a decision-making tool, <laughs> right? So, so what happens is that they, they, they're very good at their thing, but we yeah. want them to become leaders over time, but we don't train them to Keith's point. We don't train them to become leaders. We think because they have a PhD, they're inherently leaders, <laughs> especially if it's a, you know, from a tier one school, MIT, where they've got, you know, an engineering degree, aerospace, you know, uh, whatever it might be, you know, physics, uh, space dynamics, whatever it might be. And so leaders that are passionate 
value-based leaders that can see the vision of what the organization can become and build that to become what it should be, spend time with people. Hmm. And, and I would say, and I would go so far as to say, I actually believe that it's actually a moral obligation of leaders to develop other great leaders. And, and I could give you story after story of leaders who saw in me more than I did in myself and spent the time with me and taught and mentored me over dinner or on a, you know, a helicopter ride or whatever it was. Le leaders, as Keith indicated, right, you pick them and then you get the right ones in the right seat on the bus and then get out of the way because they will do phenomenal things for the organization. I, I always I, thought I about the I, Go ahead. Absolutely, sir. I'm no, sorry. Sorry. Sorry, Keith. I was interrupting you there. So this reminds me of a couple of things, which is a great dialogue. And that is, if you want to improve an organization, you have to improve the people in the organization. There's no such yeah. thing as, quote, improving the organization. The way you do that is you develop and invest in the people in the organization, yep. and they make the processes, the, pe the, the, the procedures, the structure, the strategies better that allow you to enable the 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 the, uh, the end state, and Neil mentioned this idea of decision making, which again I think it's important. I think the military's got this right. When you think about the mission command tool set that we have, the leader's intent, yeah. the confirmation brief, the back brief, the AAR red teaming, those that tool set. If organizations used those tool sets, I'm telling you, there would be a step function improvement not only in uh, leadership development but in the outcome that they're seeking. That's how powerful this stuff is. And I just don't think that we spend enough time, at least on the commercial side, doing this, as Neil said. We, it's, it's a deficit. People talk about it. I'm going to send you to the next seminar, but you've got to invest in people. And when you invest in people, you expect an ROI at the end of the day. This is the easiest podcast that I've ever ran. Continue. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> so I, I was just going to say, here, here's the thing about training. Um, this this book right here <laughs> is my, my – you probably have one just like it. It's my yep. battle book when I was a captain in, in the 160th. Mm. I, I have had this on my desk since I was a captain. It was on my desk when I was a three-star. Wow. To, re to remind me of the fundamental skill sets. And, and what happens is we, <laughs> we, we tend to think that, that we can't resource training and we can't provide the training because we're so busy. It, yep. And it's the fallacy, right? The, the actual fact is you can't afford not to. So when I, was, when I was in my previous job, just before I retired, I required all my 06s and above. You will go to one school every year, no matter what. Mm. You got one week, you pick the school, I'll pay for it. I don't care where it's at. I don't care what university, what organization, what industry training, but you're going to go to a school. You're going to continue your professional education. Now, the problem with that idea is you don't get relief from your day job while you're in school. Yeah. <laughs> you you got to do that at night, <laughs> but you've got to dedicate some time to, to where you can, you can think, and, and step back from the forest that you're fighting in every day, the trees that are around you <laughs> that you're trying to cut down every day. You got to step back and go, here's the big scheme of things. And this idea of a very, very centralized vision and, a, and the clarity of the vision is really important. In the task force, in the Special Operations Aviation Regiment, Task Force 160, there is one mission in life and everybody knows it. And it is, yep. it is the value base of the organization. You will get to the target plus or minus 30 seconds, no excuses. And everybody is on that mission set. Everybody in that organization is on that train. We will not quit until that reality becomes true. And you reinforce it in everything. And, and when, the, when the, the organization and the leader has that clarity, it's very, very powerful. And when and it's not about what you put on the wall. <laughs> it's not about a vision statement on the wall with these 16 yeah. priorities. It's got nothing to do with that. It is embedded in the thing that you breathe and the thing that you bleed. It is what the organization sees themselves as collectively and individually. 
And when those are aligned, the outcome is hugely powerful. Yeah, I, I love that. that. Go ahead. Go ahead. I love it. <laughs> no. so, I was going to say, this reminds me of something that is often a core, uh, attributed to General Patton, but others have said it as well. Never tell people how to do something. Always yep. tell them what has to be done. And they will amaze you with their ingenuity. And that's the exact point that Neil's making. And yeah. I've been thinking about this for a while now. Well, longer than a while, but I've recently developed a new word. And I'm going to share this, this word for, with you. And the word is transformance. It's just a word that I made up. So when I think about strategic leadership or I think about enterprise leadership, there's two things that you have to get right. One, you have to perform today. So this is about working in the business. It's about mm. working in your unit. But simultaneously, you have to be thinking as a leader about changing the organization for the future. That's what I would describe as working on the business. Now, here's the trick. You have to do both of these things simultaneously. So if you're in the corporate world, you can never take your eye off the revenue stream. If you do that, you're not going to have a business over time. But if that's all that you're focused on and you're not thinking about what the future will look like, you will not be able to thrive, probably not even be able to survive in a VUCA world. You just won't make it. And so I've taken these two words, this idea of performing and transforming, and I've combined them into this word called transformance. That's what leaders have to do if you want to thrive and win in this world. You have to be adaptable. You have to be agile. You have to have the right structure, systems, and processes that enable the, the team to execute. And I'm often asked, well, why do we talk about culture all the time if this is so important? Yeah. The reason that we talk about culture is because the culture is an enabler to the execution of the strategies. Yeah. That's why culture is important. And, and leaders have to shape that culture and they have to do it every single day by the things they say, the stories they tell, the, the, the model, the, the behaviors that they exhibit super important to get right and all that ties to everything that we've been talking about purpose vision mission supporting strategies allocation of resources in ways means all of that when you when you just listening to ourselves talk about this it, it makes total common sense most people would agree with all of this and yet somehow we've got 30 30 percent of our CEO, only 30 percent of our ceos say i have the right capacity that blows my mind yeah. yeah. So think about that capacity, right? If, if and and tie that, you know, to the connective tissue of the earlier conversations. So if, if your capacity as a leader is all used up in getting the thing right today, then you have no capacity to think about tomorrow. Mm. You don't. If you're if you're all your capacity is used up in the performance of today, you have no capacity to be the transformational leader for tomorrow. And, and it gets back to the vision. And I'll, I'll, I'll use Andrew as an example, right? The six founders of Andrew all came out of the commercial marketplace, very, very successful. They said these words, and this is a, a core thing. This is like plus or minus 30 seconds on the target. <laughs> we are going to do things differently, period. Whatever, whatever we've been doing since 1915 in acquisition, we're not going to do it. And, and we're going to find ways to do it differently. And that passion yeah. drives that organization. Um, the, the widgetry is widgetry, but the idea to be different and stick with that. And they talk about it all the time in every meeting. What are we doing different? Why are we doing it this way? How can we mm -hmm. do it faster? And, and, and you have to reinforce that conversation every time you, you get into a, a common, uh, you know, in a meeting, General Nicholson's words, common understanding, shared visualization. And, and when you have that complete picture um, and, and by the way, you, it's a continuous evolution of work. It's not something you get done today. It's something you develop every day and work on it every day uh, and change every day. So I wrote down culture and I, that was one of the things that I really wanted to kind of to talk about because I've, I've worked in organizations that have okay cultures and the performance has been okay. And then I've seen the power of what one leader can do, both for the bad and both for the good, of within 90 days, 
being able to completely change what that one company was, you know, the, 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 the ugly sister of the bad company within a battalion to the top company because of that one leader and how they were able to shape the culture. And I just started writing things down as both you gentlemen talked about having that leadership capacity, frequency, being with your people, focusing on your people, deeds and words. And I always used to live by that motto, deeds, not words, is that actions speak louder than words but as i'm growing in my leadership maturity i understand words are also just as powerful so you have to be able to to communicate clearly but also follow through with action and having trust and then most importantly going back to your people at every given time i think culture is one of the hardest things to really bound down um especially at like strategic level leadership keith for example i think what uh one of your co corporations that you ran had over 35 people or thirty five thousand people sam's club i was doing yeah, some right. linkedin right. stocking on you <laughs> maybe oh there you go <laughs> yeah but that's that blows my mind um from a, an organization that is at large like afies maintaining yeah. a culture how do you do that at such a high level and then serve for you too, like working within Ricto or being a PEO of missiles in space. Like that is a culture uh, of a huge organization. How, how do you manage and keep that? Well, I'll give you my perspective. And again, I'm just one man thinking about it, but this is, as we talked about earlier, leadership is a journey, C building the culture and sustaining that culture. And if you're trying to change your culture, by the way, in a transformational way, the data suggests that those journeys are five to seven years. So as a leader, oh. one way that you can do that is you're, you're, you're always uh, under the microscope, so to speak. You're always on display. You're always telling the story. And one of the ways that I used to do that is when I was a CEO and when I was a CG is I had, I created some little three by five cards and everywhere I went, I would talk about what I called my four rules of the road, basically my leadership philosophy. Don't bunt, no second place trophies, look for yellow cars and solve for yes. And then I tell a story about each one of those. So you have to model the right kinds of behaviors. And mm -hmm. I think it's also important that when, you come, when it comes to shaping culture, you have to be able to get rid of all of the policies and procedures and the mm -hmm. structure that makes absolutely no sense. Because people will hide behind the policies. And if we have time at the end, I'll tell you a Burger King story. But it's a common thing. Middle managers love the status quo because yeah. there's no intellectual curiosity. There's no emotional energy that you, that you need to exhibit. It's like, just float on. Let's kick the can down the road here. Mm -hmm. And that, that attitude is rampant in large organizations because these people, you know, everybody can kind of hide in the middle here. So you've got the senior leaders nodding about, yes, we're going to go do this. And we've got this vision and purpose and we're all rallied behind it. Then you've got the middle managers that maybe nodding their heads in meetings, but at the end of the day, they're like, nah, I, I don't believe in this. I'm going to kick the can down the road. So I think one is you have to have, you got to have a stump speech. You got to talk about it all the time. You have to recognize and reward those that are living up to the standards and the behaviors and as Shine would say, so he talked a lot about culture, there are primary levers you can pull and there are embedding levers you can pull. Mm. And recognizing and rewarding the right kinds of behaviors is one of the things that's on the top of the list. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that if I could. And, and those are great points. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put this on a little more personal level. If you want to change the culture in an organization, you have to be that culture. Hmm. You as the leader have to be that culture, whether that's a um, wh whatever culture you want. If you if you are not that as a leader, the organization will never become that. I, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you a, a couple examples. I'll give you a military one and a, not a military one. As a young captain, when I was flying in the task force, I were on a mission set and I had a young soldier. His call sign was Weasel. His real name was Jim Lee Grand. Great young E-4. He was a crew chief on, on my aircraft. We were flying 40, 40, MH-47s uh, at the time. We're down. We're out of country doing a mission. And back in those days, we had um, satellite phones, right, with biggest suitcases. <laughs> you know, there was no 
pocket thing back in those days. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I carried my big old suitcase with me everywhere I went with a little bitty phone in it. And uh, and I'm out there walking around, you know, walking around leadership and watching Jimmy do some minutes on the aircraft. And I can tell he's very di- distracted. And uh, and he's struggling with this this maintenance task. And so I walk up to talk to him. Hey, hey, Weasel, what's going on? You OK? He goes, you know, sir, my wife is back at home and she's at the doctor today with our first baby. They're mm. doing the doing the prenatal checks. And her his wife was um, uh, hearing challenged. And and I'm like. OK, I got it. I, I, I ha- broke out my suitcase phone. <laughs> I said, call your I got the doctor on the phone. Talk to your wife right now. That was a very impactful thing for that young soldier. Mm. Um, now, fast forward 10 years later, I'm as a one star in Afghanistan. Jimmy Legrand is now the first sergeant of a company. <laughs> well, wow. and and I walk in. I didn't even know who he was. I walk in to the Chinook company there just to check on and walk around in the middle of the morning because you can't sleep when you get there. Right. So it's three o'clock in the morning. I'm walking through the hangar. That's what aviators do. And I walk into the talk and there's Jimmy. As the first sergeant, by the way, it happens to be the same company of that top Chinook that my dad commanded in 1967 in Vietnam. Oh, wow. Same company, the Pachyderms. And it was great to see him again. And I had forgotten about that whole experience until he brought it up. Because you have no, he said, sir, you have no idea that the impact that you made that day. You, you have to be the leader of the culture you want around you. Fast forward now, just last week in our company. We had a young lady in the UK, to Keith's earlier point. She was filled with some equipment uh, to the to the, the Royal um, Military in the UK. <laughs> She's down in the bowels of the organization, and, and she is doing a great job. She has no idea who I am. You know, she has no – I mean, she knows who I am. I'm the division lead. I'm the senior vice president. And I call her on the phone in the UK. <laughs> hey, you don't really know me. But I'm just mm. calling to tell you thank you <laughs> for working so hard and doing such a great job. And uh, and 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 she, I don't think anybody ever called her before. <laughs> so I guess my message to those two stories are, if you want to change the culture, you have to become the culture you want. And you have to demonstrate it in your actions. And as Keith said, you have to repeat it all the time. And, and you have to live it. Because if you don't leave it, because you're in a glass house, as Keith said, you don't get any B days. All your days are A days. And 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 you have to behave that way, not only when people are watching you, but when people aren't watching you. And, if, and because there are no B days and there are no free days uh, when you're a leader. That's one of the most powerful things, I think, is that always do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, uh, not because it's the most convenient or other people are watching you. Cause I think that's the truest test of a, a character for anyone is it, it, like, if you get in the car, the grandma rule, would, would you put your seatbelt on if your grandmother was in the car beside you? hundred percent you would, but do you do it when you're just by yourself uh, every single day? And I think that's a hallmark of, of a great leader, regardless of the level. I want to be respectful of your time. If I could still, two hours I would I haven't even touched the top of most of the questions that I want <laughs> but one of the things that I, I really wanted to get into was the um, leadership program that you both worked on building the curriculum for the University of Alabama Huntsville uh, so that's something near and dear to my heart because I'm thinking now about potentially getting a doctorate in leadership uh, because I absolutely love this topic and you can see I just got off work I'm still kind of in my uniform and this is stuff that I absolutely love doing and i just moved from PO aviation where I worked on smaller drones. Um, so the university of Alabama Huntsville is like a close to my heart. If you could kind of go through that curriculum and the topic and, and what you guys are offering. Well, so, I, I would so, say this, go ahead now. No, Keith, go ahead. Go ahead, please. <laughs> okay. Well, I was going to just want to underscore one of the things that we were just talking about is people will believe the messenger long before they believe the message. This whole idea of developing culture, as Neil was talking about, you you just cannot over communicate that enough. That's yeah. one of the secrets to to great leaders. In terms of the University of Alabama, I think Neil hit on this earlier. What we've discovered is, especially on the technical side, 
we have some great engineers. We have some great rocket scientists. We've got some great yeah. contractors in in organizations and in the military. But now that there's they but they there's some civilians. And they just haven't had the leadership training that they need to make a difference. So if you fundamentally believe that leaders make a difference at every level in every organization, regardless of your functional specialty, then organizations need to invest in people. That's how they're going to improve the revenue stream. That's how they're going to drive costs down. That's how they're going to drive radical collaboration and improve trust. And so we were looking at this and saying, okay, how can we develop some curriculum? A, a, a class, if you will, that at least begins to build the foundation of what effective leadership is about. And, and notice that I use the word effective here as opposed to efficient. So we need effective leaders. What do effective leaders do? These are leaders of character, competence, and courage. They do the right thing. They do the harder right instead of the easier wrong, as you just said. That's what we need in organizations. And that's what that was all about. Neil, over to you to add. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add to that. My, my experience has been pretty clear in, in a lot of areas. Um, and what I found in is in industry and in the military, we did the same thing. I'll just use Army Aviation as an example. Um, we we picked great platoon sergeants in Army Aviation because they were great crew chiefs. <laughs> they may not know how to be a platoon sergeant at all, but, man, they could fix helicopters. <laughs> And, and sometimes we get a great mechanic who's also a great leader. And occasionally in industry and in government civilian workforce, where you have high performing, high thinking PhDs, Huntsville is a very good example of this. Yeah. You know, more PhDs per capita in Huntsville than any other place in the nation. And, and we, we bring them out of college because they're great at their task, man. They can do engineering like no one's business. And then they will go back and get a master's and they're good at it. They go back and get a PhD. And, and pretty soon, because they're great engineers, we put them in charge of two engineers. And then we put them in charge of three engineers. And that's okay. And then pretty soon they're in charge of 20 and have no idea how to be in charge of 20 people. Because yeah. they're not doing the math every day anymore. Now they're responsible for people doing the math. And the engineering the life is like an hourglass, right? High skill sets at the base, but we put them through this funnel of leadership and a few come out on the top and they're great physicists and great leaders, but very few. Why is that? It's because we don't spend the time in organizations developing them outside their expertise in a PhD area. So I'll, 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 use, a, I'll use an example uh, in, in acquisition. You get a young major comes into a command and he's coming out of the operational army. He's done great things, very successful, or he wouldn't be in the acquisition corps. Same in industry. They, they, they progress up because they're very successful. And all of a sudden they're in charge of a team. And if they're young, aggressive people in the industry or in the military, they're in charge of a team that's generally older than them, yep. have more experience than them, have more education than them. And what happens is they immediately abdicate all their leadership responsibilities based on experience. And I use that term deliberately. What they don't have, they have a lot of experience, but they don't have is the academic education hmm. of leadership that Keith's talking about. The combination of experience and education is called wisdom. <laughs> and, and bringing those to bear as a leader is what, what we're trying to, to get them to think about in this course. They have all the technical skills, but we need them to lead through those technical outcomes. Um, and, and, and it's the same on the other side, right? You got a lot of great leaders. They can't do the math. Yeah. <laughs> they, they can't solve the technical problem. They can't even understand the technical problem. Um, and so the building leaders that can balance both sides, right? There's a plenty of studies and, and, you know, Keith and I can quote numbers all day long. Most CEOs are well-rounded people, <laughs> right? They were good at one point in their life about a very specific thing, but most of them have a pretty well-rounded outcome, at least the successful ones. And and I know we're going long here. And, and if you can't tell, Keith and I are very passionate about this thing called leadership. Uh, it is something that that we feel uh, very strongly about and have a lot of passion about and, and have a lot of experience. Some not so successful, some very successful. <laughs> and, and, the, and, and the scar tissue that we call development 
in the in the leadership skills. So I'll just pause there. So I think it's almost impossible to distill down all of the leadership wisdom that both of you gentlemen have in one hour. Uh, I could probably do an individual episode with each one of you, and it would be two hours long, a hundred percent. And it's funny when when I in Huntsville we were playing soccer with my kids. We'd always go out Saturdays, uh, and I'd ask the parents, "Hey, what do you do for a living?" I'm a mechanical engineer. I'm an aeronautical engineer. I'm an engineer, and it's like, "What do you do?" I'm an army acquisitions. Every single person that my daughter would play on sports teams with was was an engineer. But that level of technical acumen kind of raised me up in in a way of where I had to kind of grow that area. And I've always looked at. Uh, from a standpoint of leadership of being a lake versus a well. Uh, I, I, I'm i okay with being a foot deep and a mile wide. I don't need to be that dangerous in certain things. Certain things maybe I got to get a little bit deeper in, but wells, that's people on my team, those subject matter experts at least, of where they need to be a mile deep and a foot wide and being okay with not understanding everything, but being able to get down to at least the third level. So if you ask me a question, sir, I'd kind of pride myself on being able to get to that third level. But beyond that, that's what I have my team for. And that's that's very hard to do, I think, to for a technical person who is an engineer by trade, being able to pull back from the work because that's all they've ever known. That's that's their you know self-worth is tied to that. Their Their job satisfaction is tied to that. And then leading other people, that's a challenge. And I commend both of you because that's uh, that curriculum, I think, is going to be extremely powerful, especially in Huntsville with some of the hypersonics and, and the space programs, especially the drone technology that is taking place and that is needed uh, right now. If anyone wants to learn more about that program, how could they find it? So uh, the best place to do it is part of the School of Business. Uh, Dr. Jason Green is the dean of the School of Business. Under that umbrella is a continuing education program for the University of Huntsville, uh, Alabama, Huntsville. Um, that's where it's at. And, uh, and we got a great team that has been putting this together and helping Keith and I put this together. Uh, and Fatia, who, who runs the continuing education program, has just been really super. Her and Amber and the whole team over there have been super helping us do this. Uh, and and just watch for the announcements of the school. Uh, you know, this kind of a three or four day workshop, depending on how it folds out. And just watch for it there uh, on the University of Alabama Huntsville's uh, school page. Uh, and then, of course, there's an, uh, here locally, there'll be announcements in Huntsville and in, in the area. So just watch for it there. I'll work with Amber too uh, within the show notes. So when this actual officially airs, I'll work with her to make sure that that's kind of bounded and clear uh, for anyone who is listening to this episode. The last question that I have for both of you gentlemen is how can our listeners find you and add value to any of your current missions if they want to reach out? Neil? Yeah, it's real easy for me. Uh, you can just reach out to uh, um, my email address. It's... Uh, lnthurgood at gmail.com lnthurgood at gmail.com um you can send me a text message on my phone 256-479-5633 that's a bold uh, move sir it is a bold move <laughs> uh, but look if you have passion for what you're doing it's it's easy to be bold about about those kind mm. of things yeah, yeah. And I, I would say I, you can reach me at the University of Texas at Dallas. So you can just Google me there. and I'll give you my email address as well. It's Keith.Thurgood at gmail.com. Although I'm actually thinking of changing that to Supreme Nacho Grande at gmail.com. <laughs> so you, you know. uh, like Neil, we're happy to talk to anybody. We're passionate about this. We fundamentally believe that we need great leaders of character and competence, not only for the sake of the nation, but for yeah. the military, for schools, our families, our communities. So we want to help wherever we can to have an impact. Gentlemen, it's, it has been an absolute honor. I really mean that for you taking time uh, to go through your journey with me and also share your leadership wisdom. Uh, I've learned a lot. I'm now on page six. So <laughs> thank you again. All right. Have a great evening. Thanks for having us. Yeah. And by the way, my last piece of advice to you, Joshua, is when you work on your PhD, make sure you call us so we can give you some good advice on setting up your dissertation committee. Okay. No. <laughs> so I, you I, know. 100%. All right. <laughs>